if you're a high achiever, if you're a go, go, go person, it can be very hard to rest. It can be very hard to turn our brain off to say, you know what, I'm just going to do something fun for me to relax. And alcohol can be the way that we choose to do that because it's easy. It's there. It's an external force that's helping us relax instead of an internal choice that we make to rest and relax. And so, and also we're not actually resting and relaxing. Remember that alcohol is raising your cortisol levels, but maybe mentally it helps you feel like you're turning your brain off a little bit. Hello and welcome to today's episode of What We Tell Our Daughters. Today, we are going to talk about the topic of alcohol consumption. And this is a topic that... I think can be really triggering for some people if they find that alcohol is something they lean on for stress reduction. And I'm saying this because I personally in the past have, I think, mentally justified my intake of alcohol, saying it was moderate, saying it was helping me um, with stress levels. Even with all of the extensive health knowledge I have, I still found ways to do mental gymnastics into talking myself into believing that it was okay. And this stems from the fact that we took, my husband and I took a month off from drinking alcohol. And I've done this a lot in the past, but never have I come away from that month with resolve and really um, obvious changes in how I felt and how I interacted with the world and how I was able to show up. And I think part of that is that I'm living in a time where I have a lot less sleep than normal because I have a tiny human who still wakes up a lot. And I have a lot of really big dreams for my life right now and really big goals. Not that I haven't always, but these goals require me to have as much mental acuity as possible and motivation as possible in a time where sleep is lacking. Uh, Motivation can be harder to find. So anything that helps improve that, I think I feel really intensely. So all of that is to say that taking this month off of alcohol this time around really drove home, you know, just how important it is for some of the things that I want to accomplish in my life. So we're going to talk about alcohol today from two perspectives. One, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I experienced and why anecdotally, I think this is important for all of us as parents, especially sleep deprived parents. And then two, I want to talk about it from a physical perspective of what's happening in your body and why alcohol intake can be so detrimental to our menstrual cycles, to our fertility, to our hormone health, to all of those pieces, because that is also a huge player here uh, for a lot of women, I think. Um, And I think that there's this fine line we walk between wanting to show up as the best, most optimized version of ourselves and also needing to find outlets to rest and slow down. And I think that's one of the reasons that alcohol can be so touchy for people is because for so many of us, it is the way that we unwind or the way that we relax. And so to for someone to say that they want to take that away from us because it's better for our health feels like a jab when you don't have other outlets for that rest. So let's start with just a a little bit more of kind of why I decided to give up alcohol for the month. And so I mentioned just that it was time, it was time, you know, since I had had my daughter almost two years ago, I hadn't really taken a, a consistent break. And so I think what happens when we don't take a consistent break from anything, from, um, doing the same thing every day, from exercising, from alcohol, from eating sugar, from, stress inducing activities, you know, whenever we don't separate ourselves from that for a little bit, we don't recognize the change that's happening in our body. So we don't actually feel that difference until it's gone for long enough that our body can kind of reset and forget what it was like when it was there. So it was time for this reset, for this break so that I could remember and start to tap into physically how The question was, how different do I feel? What differences can I feel? And is alcohol a needle mover for me in terms of 
making me less effective, affecting my sleep, et cetera, because it is true that it's different for different people. You know, in the past, I think I felt like when I let go of alcohol, I didn't really feel that much of a physical difference. And I think that's partly because I was at a very different stage in my life where I was getting as much sleep as I needed. I was able to have pretty much complete control over my day and what happened. And I still had motivation or if I had motivation, it just took a little bit longer in the day for it to kick in. It didn't matter as much because I could work late or I could work when that motivation did hit. And now I have a small person who dictates a lot of how my day goes. And so I need every moment that I have free for my brain to be functioning at a hundred percent. So it was time to see how this, how this would work for me. And now it's been more than six weeks, almost seven weeks since I haven't really had alcohol. Last night I had about a quarter of a glass of wine and I'll tell you, I saw a decrease in my um, readiness score. So aura with my aura ring, I track readiness and my deep sleep went down. My heart rate variability went down. And this was like a quarter of a glass of wine probably four hours before I went to bed. So a good long time. And I still saw that uh, effect on my overall health the next day. I think in the past, I didn't notice this as much because I was probably drinking alcohol so consistently, like two or three times a week um, with dinner or before bed that I didn't see the effect over time because I was kind of always living in a state where my body was recovering from that, if that makes sense. So that is where I'm at today. That's why I decided to give it up. I will tell you that I don't plan on ever going back to drinking the way I used to, which was very social Uh, moderation. Yes, but consistent, right? Like multiple times a week and even just at home with dinner, having a glass of wine, something like that, that feels very light. It doesn't feel like it's going to be harming your body because it feels like, oh, this is just a little bit and it's not every day. And it's um, just a nice way to wind down. But ultimately I think what I've felt is that that was actually taking a bigger toll on my body than I realized. What I do think is really interesting is Gen Zers. So the generation beneath me, my brother and my sister's generation they're drinking less than we as millennials are and millennials are drinking less than baby boomers. So the boomers drink the most. We, if you look at millennials and you ask, uh, studies have asked millennials how much they drink about 50% of millennials say that they drink maybe a little bit more. When we look at Gen Zers, it's even lower. It's like 20 to 30%. This is actually really cool. I think that there's a lot of information now about how alcohol affects our body there are, there's a lot more awareness around health. And I think that unfortunately that sort of is a side effect of the fact that our health is really suffering in this world we live in right now. That's full of toxins and stressors and this fast paced life we've created for ourselves. Uh, Jen, Zers are actually physically feeling the effects of that a lot younger. So even at 20, they might not feel as good as we felt at 20. And so they're more quick to look and say, well, what are the things that might be affecting my health that might make me feel better if I take these out? And alcohol is definitely one of those. My brother and my sister really hardly ever drink, you know? And when I was their age, I was drinking a lot, right? I was in college in a sorority for a couple of years and we were drinking a lot. So the narrative around alcohol has changed, I think, significantly, which for the better and the recognition and the knowledge for younger generations of what role alcohol is playing in their health is a lot more prominent. I think that there's a much larger movement now for mocktails and dry bars and things like that. So that it's, the focus is more on relationship building and not around the actual act of drinking, which I think is really amazing and super positive. And I think we could take a book, uh, a note from the Gen Zers. What is that? A page out of the Gen Zers book uh, when it comes to this. So I just thought that was really interesting when we look at the numbers, because actually I'll tell you, I thought that we as millennials were drinking more than boomers. I really did just because of what I know of the friends I have and the mindset we have around alcohol. And I don't remember my parents really drinking at all. Um, but overall 
Gen, uh, Gen Zers drink the least, millennials drink the middle, and, and boomers are drinking the most. So from there, I want to talk about the physical benefits of abstaining from alcohol. So what's really happening to our body when we drink alcohol? And there's a few things that I think are super important for us to understand. One, the minute we have any amount of alcohol in our body, our cortisol levels go up. We know that cortisol is a driver for so many pieces of our hormonal balance, our stress levels, our anxiety, depression, sleep, all of these pieces are really, really affected by our cortisol levels. So the minute we start drinking alcohol, we are affecting a lot more than just our liver's ability to detox. We're affecting all types of hormonal pathways here. And you might feel that, right? Like maybe you have a glass of alcohol with lunch, like you have a beer with lunch. And then in the evening, the rest of the day, you just don't really feel that great. Even if it was just a little bit, that's because now your cortisol levels are increased for the rest of the day and your body's having to do detox work. But in addition to that, your hormone pathways are, are a little bit screwed up from just that one drink. So that can play a really big role for people. And I think one thing that people note a lot when they stop drinking alcohol is their sleep improves. And the cortisol piece has a huge part to play in this because increased cortisol leads to decreased melatonin, leads to worse deep sleep, worse overall sleep, worse sleep quality, all of the things. Dehydration, I could go on. So that's one piece of the puzzle is the cortisol piece. The other piece of the puzzle is the way that alcohol affects all of our other hormones. So there's a study that I will link to in this podcast, and you can go read it if you want. It's very long, but it's very comprehensive, and it's all about the effects of alcohol on the endocrine system. And what we see now is that acute alcohol exposure, so having a drink with lunch, for example, that would be acute, can lead to increases in luteinizing hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone. Um, increase in estradiol and a decrease in testosterone and progesterone. What does that tell us right there? One alcoholic drink, acute exposure can affect all of these hormones that are so important for this menstrual cycle symphony that we have for all of these hormones to work together. And I want to frame this and kind of pull back to the big picture because if somebody is struggling with any one of these, like say they need their luteinizing hormone to be higher, right? Maybe their luteinizing hormone is too low. And they're like, oh, well, this seems like if I drink luteinizing, if I drink alcohol, my luteinizing hormone will be better. Let's remember that none of these hormone effects happen in a bubble. It's going to affect all of these at once. And none of these altogether leads to something good. There's nothing good that's going to come from this especially when we look at the estrogen pathways, because alcohol is a toxin and your liver is going to prioritize detoxing alcohol before it detoxes any of your other hormones. So that could be one of the things that's playing into that increase in estrogen, that increase in cortisol is your liver is like, you know what? I only have so much bandwidth each day and I have to do these detox processes and that your liver needs very specific nutrients in order to detox as well. There's phase one and there's phase two. They require different types of nutrients, um, proteins, amino acids, things like that. And if it doesn't have those things, then it can't do its job. And it's going to use up that store detoxing alcohol and it won't have what it needs left in order to detox your other hormones like estrogen, like cortisol. So then we can see increases in estrogen, increases in cortisol that maintain over a longer period of time, especially if you're consistently drinking alcohol. If you've ever heard of estrogen dominance, that's this idea that, well, not idea, it is a thing where we have a unopposed estrogen in the second half of our cycle, meaning that we have excess estrogen in comparison to the amount of progesterone we have. So maybe if you get a blood test, your estrogen's actually in the normal range, your progesterone might be in the normal range. But when we look at the ratio of those two, we have excess estrogen. Well, I just told you that alcohol lowers progesterone and raises estrogen. So right there, you see immediately that's going to shift that ratio so that we are no longer in a positive place. Like the, there's too much estrogen to progesterone. And when that happens, we get this range of effects. We can have excess PMS. We can have uh, painful periods, heavier bleeding. Um, this can even lead to lack of ovulation, things like that over time. So this is a really big issue when we're talking about healthy, happy menstrual cycles and especially fertility. 
Um, when we look at chronic alcohol exposure, so that's just consistently drinking over time, we can see decrease in luteinizing hormone, testosterone, and progesterone. And as I said, an increase in estradiol and follicle stimulating hormone. So the big thing here is that with time, we actually see a decrease in luteinizing hormone with chronic alcohol exposure compared to acute alcohol exposure, which that is also a risk factor for fertility, right? If we need luteinizing hormone to spike to, to induce ovulation, and we have these decreases in those hormones, we may not be ovulating in that cycle. And that can lead to an ovulatory cycles where you don't ovulate. And whenever we don't ovulate in a cycle, it can lead to all kinds of different symptoms because then we don't have progesterone in the second half of our cycle. Uh, we don't have that normal uh, corpus luteum creation and then degradation that leads to that fall in hormones that starts your period. Instead, you may end up having a, a period or a cycle, a menstrual cycle that lasts a lot longer. Maybe it's like 40, even longer, 60 days. Um, because there's no ovulation, there's nothing to regulate that second half and say, okay, now it's time for a period or I'm pregnant. Instead, what triggers the period is actually just fluctuating hormone levels in a non-happy way. Those are irregular hormone levels. So all of that plays into how we, how our menstrual cycle is regulated and how we feel. Ultimately, I think this is really important for us to remember because if you're a woman and you're trying to understand your body and you're trying to either get pregnant or avoid pregnancy or just become more in tune with what it looks like to have a, a menstrual cycle where you can actually tap into the magic of each of those phases, alcohol is going to override a lot of these phases and we're not going to be able to feel what we need to in order to really understand what's happening in my body right now. How do I feel? How can I use this particular feeling that I have right now to my advantage uh, and really benefit from the hormonal cascade that's happening? So that's a little bit about some of the physical effects of alcohol. And that's really just scratching the surface. You know, we see an impact in bone. We see an impact on our kidneys because we're usually dehydrating ourselves when we drink alcohol. So there's lots of different ways that this can play a role. And when we look at um, even things like cancer, if the body is really, really focused on detoxifying toxins like alcohol that is coming into our system, it doesn't have the energy or the time or the space to go do what we call autophagy, which is this cellular cleanup, this cleaning of house of old dead cells or um, irregular cells that need to be removed. And that's how we can get overgrowth of certain types of cells or malignancy. So it's important to remember that anytime our bodies are in a active detox state consistently, we're not giving it the time or the space it needs to heal, to rest, to rejuvenate, to rebuild, to start fresh, so to say. Now, that's from a physical perspective, right? From a more biological perspective, those are all the things that are happening. I'm going to tell you now just about mentally, emotionally, physically, what I've noticed for my own body, because I think, I hope that what I share with you makes you curious about your own body and your own life and the changes that you might experience. So for me, I've noticed a huge shift in my motivation. I can wake up first thing in the morning and just start working. And I am instantly motivated and kind of always motivated to keep moving, to do the things I need to do to become the person I want to be. You know, there's this concept of be, do, have, be the person that does the things to achieve the things that you want. Instead of having these goals of, I want this, I want that, I want X, Y, Z thing. Those are things that we can't actually control. I can't control the outcome. What I can control is how I show up every day in order to make the things happen, right? So at the end of the day, at the end of my life, if I look back and I say, you know, I didn't really achieve a lot of the things that I wanted to achieve, but I, every single day I showed up and I did the work to make those things happen. One, it's pretty unlikely that I'm actually going to not achieve those things, but two, it's hard to be upset with yourself or feel like something is lacking if you're showing up and doing the work all the time. So I've noticed that it's much easier for me to show up, to start, 
to dive in to continue to be consistent with the things I know matter to me in my life. The other thing that I've noticed is my sleep is better. As I mentioned, like I can sleep for six, six and a half hours and still get almost two hours of deep sleep and REM sleep. Whereas before when I was drinking more consistently, I don't think I ever got more than an hour of each. And that's even on days when I didn't drink, because I think that there was this like lagging catch up that my body had to do. And so it never got to the place where it was able to just rest and recover without having to do some of this like cleanup that was left over from previous days. So here's the other thing is I don't really want it anymore. Like the thought of paying the price physically, uh, emotionally, or mentally the next day of not having the acuity that I want to have is just not worth it. So much so that I think my body has decided that it doesn't even taste that great anymore. Like I really do love red wine, or at least I think I do. I used to love red wine and that little bit of red wine last night I had with my pasta, I was like, "Mm, just not doing it for me. Whereas I think in the past I would have been like, this is delicious. I love it. And this is a, not a shitty wine. You know, it's a good wine from, from Sardinia in Italy. We ordered a lot of Cannonau, which is side note, Cannonau, red wine Cannonau from Italy is uh, the wine that they drink in the blue zone of Italy. So the people who live the longest. So this was like another one of my mental justifications, right? For drinking. I was like, well, in all the blue zones, they still drink some alcohol and they live to be a hundred and you know, they're happy and healthy. And while that is true, there's these two sides to the coin, right? There's this side of living a very peaceful daily rest filled life full of friends and laughter and joy and satisfaction. And like, I will tell you, these are, these are the conflicting two parts of my life that I'm always trying to find the balance in. And to this day I haven't. So I think this is forever going to be my lifelong journey is, is finding the balance between these two things. One is this side of me that just wants to achieve It just wants to go. It wants to create. It wants to leave the world with something bigger than just myself. It wants to show my daughter that her mama did something that matters, that contributed to women's health, that contributed to more women having power that they didn't have before. So there's that part of me. And let's be honest, that's probably the ego part of me, the one that needs to achieve something, to accomplish something, to say that I left something behind. And then there's this part of me that's like, well, I just actually want to have like really good friends and eat good food together and rest and laugh and have a good time. Those people are actually the people that live the longest, the ones that choose the more peaceful, simple life, the ones that go hard, push hard and try to accomplish a lot. uh, They don't tend to live as long because our stress levels are higher. We don't sleep as much, et cetera. And And we have to remember that, sure, maybe I accomplished all of those things, but in four generations, will anyone remember any of those things? Maybe, maybe if I really do something big or maybe not at all. So we have to balance these two pieces of ourselves. And I think that actually this is really relevant to alcohol because this is one area where if you're a high achiever, if you're a go, go, go person, it can be very hard to rest, it can be very hard to turn our brain off to say, you know what, I'm just going to do something fun for me to relax. And alcohol can be the way that we choose to do that because it's easy. It's there. It's an external force that's helping us relax instead of an internal choice that we make to rest and relax. And so, and also we're not actually resting and relaxing. Remember that alcohol is raising your cortisol levels, but maybe mentally it helps you feel like you're turning your brain off a little bit. So I think this is an important thing for all of us to continue addressing. And I don't think that there's very many people in the world, if any, that truly have this completely figured out, this balance between the two, this balance between contributing to a better world, to changing the world, to leaving it better than we left it. And also to recognizing that we are actually just tiny little ants 
on this giant, giant earth and everything we do that feels so important in this moment, in this day is probably nowhere near as important as we think it is, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. So all of that is to say that another one of these revel realizations I had while not drinking was that I need better outlets for rest, for creativity, for joy, uh, not just social drinking to allow my body to come down and take a break and find that balance between the two, because both are very important to me. And I have noticed that in this time of not drinking, I've had a much harder time taking any time to slow down or stop doing, or just letting my brain rest, you know, previously, I think my husband and I would have a glass of wine and like, we'd watch a TV show. And that felt like a really good way to just unwind and turn our brain off. Well, now that we're not drinking, I don't think we've watched like any TV shows because our brains are just so on. They're so go that even in the evening, I'm reading about a book a week or sometimes even two researching women's health, thinking about how do I create something that hasn't been created yet? How do I give back? What do women need from me? And so that evening time that was previously spent on more mindless things, now even if I'm laying in bed reading, I'm still reading for learning. I'm not reading for rest. I hope that makes sense. Um, so all that is to say, alcohol, a lot of different ways that it affects our body physically, mentally, emotionally, you choose what's best for you. I'm never here to be prescriptive for you and your life. But what I do want to encourage everyone to do is just test, is to do these self experiments and get curious about what would it feel like if I did this? What would it feel like if I did this? So that at the end of the day, you're making choices that you actually made, not that you unconsciously made just on this path and you just stayed on it, right? So the idea here is that we are always seeking to be more consciously aware of our decisions, of um, the way that we show up, of how we interact with other people, of, you know, if you're a parent, how you interact with your child. And I think that when we go into these autopilot modes, we forget that we have control over a lot of these things or that one little thing could change this whole situation for us. And so I think that we need to remember alcohol might be one of those levers that we can pull on or pull it away in order to change how we feel in our daily life, how we sleep, how we show up, uh, the things we accomplish or the things we don't, maybe even how we interact with our kids, who knows? So I hope this episode was interesting and helpful and and not too much of a a ramble on my own journey, but I think, I hope it was helpful to hear what I experienced and maybe make you curious about your own experience too. So I'll see you in the next one.